Welcome to Literary Insights. This is the summary of the book The Surrender Experiment, Michael A. Singer. If you like this content, please consider subscribing and liking this video. Life unfolds according to universal forces interacting for billions of years, not according to our personal preferences and desires. However, we constantly try to control life and make it conform to what we want. This attempt to control life causes tremendous tension, anxiety, and fear. We believe things should be the way we want them to be, rather than accepting how they are. We have the power of will and can choose to apply our minds, hearts, and bodies to shape life to our desires. However, this puts us in a constant battle between our will and the reality of how life unfolds. We are only happy when we win this battle and get our way. There is evidence that life organizes itself well without our control or intervention. The universe, nature, and our bodies all operate according to life's perfection. However, we pit our will against these same forces daily. An experiment is proposed. What would happen if we respected life's flow and used our will to participate rather than fight it? Would life still unfold in a perfect, orderly way? Would it be better to let go of control and accept life as it is? The critical question is whether it is better to make up our reality and battle to make it so, or to let go of what we want and surrender to life as it unfolds. The book explores living life as an experiment to find the answer. The author, Michael Allen Singer, had a profound and life-changing experience in 1970 at 22 while sitting on the couch with his brother-in-law. In silence during their conversation, Singer suddenly became aware that he was observing his anxious mind trying to figure out what to say next. He realized there was a separation between his observing self and his thinking mind. This was a sudden and instantly transformative insight for Singer. He could see that his thoughts and emotions were just activities of the mind he had always identified with, but now he could observe them separately. Singer's newfound awareness and separation from his thinking mind initially annoyed him, as he realized how incessant and noisy the voice in his head was. However, it also gave him a longing for inner silence. Singer began spending more time alone in nature trying to quiet his mind though he found it challenging. However, this experience set him on a journey of self-discovery that changed the course of his life. The critical insight was gaining the ability to observe his mind and see that his true self was the observer, not the thoughts and emotions. This prevented him from being controlled by his fears and desires. Singer sees this journey as an experiment in surrendering to life's flow, which led to many unexpected life events and realizations that brought him a deep sense of peace. He shares his story to encourage others to find peace and appreciate life's perfection. The summary outlines the essential details of Singer's life-changing insight, how it led to his journey of self-discovery, the annoyance and longing for silence he experienced, his perspective on surrendering to life, and his motivations for sharing his story. Please let me know if you want me to clarify or expand the summary in any way. The author became aware of the constant voice of mental chatter in his head and how it commented on everything he experienced. This voice judged what he liked and didn't like and expressed fear and self-consciousness. The author became fascinated with understanding this voice and who he was underneath it. He spent much time reading psychology books to try and find answers but couldn't find a direct explanation of the voice or the self that observes it. A friend introduced the author to a book on Zen Buddhism called Three Pillars of Zen. This book described the voice he had become aware of and methods for quieting it through meditation. The author started practicing Zen meditation on his own using the techniques from the book. The author went on a camping trip and found a secluded spot for an intensive meditation session. He sat under a tree and vowed to get up when enlightened. During this meditation, he had a profound experience of the voice in his head disappearing and a sense of deep peace arising. This experience showed the author that enlightenment was about going beyond the personal mind and all its mental chatter. He realized this was possible through spiritual work and practice. The author continued his exploration through reading and meditating. In summary, the author became aware of his constant mental chatter and desired to go beyond it. He had a profound experience of transcending his mind through reading and practicing Zen meditation, which inspired him to continue spiritual work. The author describes experiencing a profoundly deep meditation state during a weekend retreat. While meditating, the author heard a loud voice sternly ask if they wanted to go deeper. 
By focusing intently on their breath, the author experienced a loss of self and entered an elevated state of consciousness. Upon returning to everyday awareness, the author felt locked in place by powerful energy flowing in their body. By continuing to meditate, the author entered an even deeper state and experienced absolute silence and a sense of deep peace. When the meditation ended, the author felt a flow of energy up their spine and an unfamiliar grace in their movements. Weeks after, the author remained in a state of clarity, peace, and silence. The author was determined never to leave this transformed state of mind. The author's life undergoes a significant change as his wife leaves him. This plunges him into turmoil and pain. However, it also allows him to deepen his meditation practice, as it only provides him peace. The author becomes increasingly reclusive and solitary. His only goal is to go deeper within himself through meditation. However, his ego or personal self keeps pulling his attention outward and causing distress. He wants to get rid of this ego self but does not know how. Signs point the author toward Mexico as a place to deepen his meditation practice during the summer. He decides to head to Mexico with no clear destination or agenda. He drives there slowly while practicing meditation. The summary highlights the author's desire for inner peace, his struggles with his ego, and his openness to follow signs pointing him toward more excellent spiritual development. A journey into the unknown, both inner and outer, is beginning. The author ended up spending time in north-central Mexico. One evening, unable to find a place to spend the night, the author drove up a hill and stayed there for many weeks, meditating and doing yoga. A young boy brought milk from his mother for the American staying on the hill. The author then went to a lake to meditate and do yoga again. While meditating, the author heard voices and horses approaching but remained focused. It turned out to be two ranch hands, who invited the author onto their horse and took him to his van. The ranch hands lived in a poor village and invited the author to visit. Poverty struck the author, and he saw things he had never seen before like women breastfeeding. The author's new friend lets him ride his horse across an open field. The author then gave the village women the rice and beans he had in his van, as he knew they struggled for food. Though the author lived in solitude, he became a celebrity in the village. The author saw this as a lesson in the joy of helping others. He felt he had let go of himself and something extraordinary had happened. He wondered if life had more to offer. The author had grown and learned a lot from his experiences in Mexico. Though he returned to Gainesville, he had no place to live and lived in his van. He realized he likely would need more time to finish his doctoral degree as he only cared about going deeper in his meditations. Though his department chair encouraged him to finish, the author would only occasionally go to class out of respect for him. One day, the professor of one course asked if he expected to get a good grade given how little he attended. The author said he would put in extra effort on the final paper. When it came time to write the paper, the author was inspired after meditating in his van. The entire paper came to him immediately, and he spent days refining and typing it. Not only did he get an A, but his professor asked if he would do his dissertation with him. The experience showed the author the difference between creative inspiration and logical thought. Months later, the author's yearning to go deeper into meditation increased. He decided to find a secluded place to focus on his practices. A gas station attendant told him about a place with five-acre lots for sale. The author found a perfect, peaceful place with adjoining lots of woods and fields. After meditating there, he knew he was home. He decided to try and buy both lots, setting a maximum price he was willing to pay that was below the asking price. The author and his friend Bob decided to build a meditation hut on the author's land. They recruited their friend Bobby, an architecture student, to design it. Bobby's design was much more elaborate than the author had envisioned. It included a wedged-shaped house with a large glass front. Despite their inexperience, they decided to build it themselves to save money. They got rough sawn lumber from a nearby sawmill that James and Mrs. Griffiths owned. At first, the Griffins were suspicious of the three long-haired hippies. However, they warmed up to them over time and invited them for dinner. Despite their initial prejudices, Mr. Griffiths said they had come to love the three boys. Building the house turned into a meaningful life experience for the author. 
Even though he just wanted a simple meditation hut, the project taught him important lessons. With the help of Bobby's guidance, the author did the electrical wiring himself. The author moved into the house in November 1971. His sister and brother-in-law braved the Spartan conditions to visit for Thanksgiving. Once alone, the author embraced the monastic lifestyle, meditating for hours daily and doing contemplative walking and yoga. He even experimented with fasting to enhance his meditative states. He aimed to discipline himself to drop the parts of himself that were obstacles to enlightenment. The summary outlines the essential details about the author and his friends building an elaborate meditation hut, the lessons and life experience the project provided, the author's embrace of an ascetic lifestyle in the hut, and his spiritual motivation and goals. The author had been intensely focusing on meditation to achieve inner freedom and experience deep peace. However, he felt stuck and unable to reach the place he longed to reach. He realized he had been going about it the wrong way. Rather than constantly trying to quiet his mind, he should ask why his mind was so active in the first place. He saw that his mental chatter revolved around his likes and dislikes, and he could quiet his mind by stopping listening to that chatter. He started practicing acceptance of whatever life presented him, beginning with simple things like the weather. He found these practices of acceptance potent in quieting his mind. He decided to push further and accept a broader range of life events, letting go of his personal preferences. He saw this as a great experiment to see what would happen if he surrendered to the flow of life. He was willing to follow wherever this experiment led him, having already seen some amazing things happen when he let go and followed subtle events, like his experiences with the Mexican villagers. In summary, the author embarked on an experiment of a lifetime to surrender to life's flow by letting go of his personal preferences and accepting whatever life brought him. He was fascinated to see where this path of surrender and acceptance might lead. The author was committed to a lifestyle of meditation and surrendering to the flow of life. As part of his graduate program, he was required to teach economics courses at the university. During one class, he accidentally came to class without a shirt but proceeded to teach the class anyway without concern for his attire. The department chair, Dr. Goffman, asked the author to tutor a successful banker, Alan Robertson, who had been chosen as the president of a new community college but needed a PhD. Despite initial resistance, the author agreed to practice surrendering to life's circumstances. He and Alan became good friends, though they were pretty different. The author refused payment for tutoring Alan. Alan encouraged the author to take his doctoral qualifying exams. The author only intended to take two of the three exams he was signed up for, but due to an administrative error, he was signed up for all three. The author viewed taking the third exam, which he was unprepared for, as an opportunity to let go of his ego and fear of failure. The day before the third exam, the author felt a sense of peace. He opened the textbook to three random pages and read them. The next day, one of those pages appeared on the exam. Despite barely studying, the author felt confident in his ability to take the exam. The key events are The author commits to surrendering to life. Despite initial reluctance, he agrees to tutor Alan Robertson, a successful banker and new college president. Due to an administrative error, the author signed up for an exam he needed to prepare for. He views this as an opportunity to overcome his ego and fear of failure. The day before the exam, he feels a sense of peace and reads three random pages of the textbook. One of those pages appears on the actual exam. The key theme is one of surrendering control and trusting in life. The events with the third exam and textbook pages illustrate how life can work in mysterious ways when we let go of our ego and fear. The author received an unexpected job offer to teach part-time at the new Santa Fe Community College. Although he had no interest in teaching and had never formally taught before, he surrendered to the events unfolding and accepted the position. For his first interview, the author dressed casually in jeans and sandals and honestly expressed his desire to teach students about meditation, inner silence, and embracing life's journey. Surprisingly, he was offered a position teaching entry-level social science classes, amounting to half-time work. He accepted, still determining what he would teach. The author decided not to plan for his first classes. He intended to walk in with an open mind and see what comes out. Meanwhile, 
he continued cherishing his time alone on his land. A woman named Sandy Boone started meditating on the author's land and eventually asked if she could join him for Sunday morning meditations. He agreed, despite his resistance, because his inner voice told him to. Over time, Sandy brought more people, and Sunday morning services at Mickey's began to emerge spontaneously. The key themes are surrender, following inner guidance, and allowing things to unfold without grasping or planning. The author is learning to embrace situations he would generally resist and see where they lead. His spiritual path is emerging without effort in a very organic way. The author had a tradition of going to a spiritual community in California for three to four weeks every summer for over 40 years. In preparation for the annual trip, the author decided to practice total silence during the visit to focus entirely on meditation and yoga. Upon arriving, the author found the community rustic with small cabins and like-minded people. The author chose to park the van in a dirt lot and live there for the stay. Daily routines of yoga, meditation, and fasting continued. The author attended evening chanting and meditation at the temple but did not participate in the chanting. One night, the author had a profound lucid dream of walking into a deep cave, searching for a light. The air grew thinner, but the author persisted. Upon reaching the light, the author found a metal grate blocking the exit. Without panic, the author turned and walked out, realizing another way would be needed. Upon awakening, the author had a transformed view that more discipline was not the path to freedom. The personal self was not the enemy but could be harnessed to assist in the journey upward. The author released the personal self from the metaphorical room it had been confined within. An emotional release followed this act. The author learned surrender and acceptance were needed rather than fighting against the self. The self and its thoughts were not to be locked away but handled constructively. The purpose of yoga became apparent as a means to channel all energies upward to oneness. The author ended the silence but continued regular practices. The challenge of acceptance arose upon returning home to find unwanted construction, demonstrating that more progress was still needed. Overall, a wiser person returned home. The author was surprised to find two strangers, Sandy and Bob, building a tiny house on his property without asking for permission. Although his mind reacted strongly at first, the author chose to remain calm and not be bothered by his thoughts or preferences. He decided to help them build the house. Helping build the tiny house was a rewarding experience for the author. He felt confident in his skills and enjoyed the work. He began dedicating all of his work and actions to God or a universal force. He wanted to let go of control and see where life would lead him. The author started teaching classes at Santa Fe College, though he had not prepared or planned anything. He found that words and lectures flowed through him effortlessly. The classes were trendy, growing from 20 to 60 students. Though the author preferred solitude, he went with the flow of what life brought to him. The author's doctoral advisor asked him to turn in a dissertation. Though the author did not feel his work was related to economics, he agreed to submit something as a favor. He ended up writing about spirituality, meditation, and the oneness behind all of science and religion. This work was eventually published as a book that continues to sell today. The author started to see less of a distinction between his life's spiritual and non-spiritual parts. The energy he felt while teaching or writing was the same as he experienced during meditation. He began to accept whatever life brought to him rather than trying to control situations according to his preferences. His life had become built through surrendering, not his own will or effort. In 1973, the land around the author's property began to be purchased by others interested in meditation and back-to-nature living. Though the author still valued solitude, he found his afternoon walks more interesting with the new neighbors. The author took a trip to California to visit his ex-wife, Shelley. During the visit, he came across pictures of an Indian yoga master named Baba Muktananda, and had a profound spiritual experience while meditating in the presence of Baba's photographs. When the author returned home to Florida, he found that a woman named Rama Malone was staying at his neighbor Sandy's place. Rama was an ardent devotee of Baba Muktananda. She insisted that the author invite Baba to visit Gainesville during his upcoming trip to the U.S. Despite his initial reluctance and skepticism, the author surrendered and sent a letter to India inviting Baba. Some months later, 
the author received a response and met with one of Baba's representatives. The representative explained the logistics required to host Baba and his entourage for a week-long visit. He was skeptical about the author's ability to arrange it given his limited means. However, the representative said the author was welcome to try to arrange things, and that they would check back with him. The author and his group have been preparing for Baba's visit to Gainesville. They found a retreat site, arranged to house for Baba's staff, and promoted the event to attract attendees. Before the visit, the author attends Baba's retreat in Atlanta. At first, he struggles to connect with Baba and the events. On the last day, he decides to surrender to the experience altogether. During meditation, Baba gives him Shaktipat, an awakening of spiritual energy. Baba touches the author, causing his energy to rush up his spine and his sense of self to leave his body. Baba then restores the author's normal state. The experience reveals Baba as an enlightened master with power over energy and the body. The author feels humbled and unburdened. Baba's staff assume the author will now see Baba as his teacher, as is expected. The author reflects on the events that led him to Baba. He is still processing the intensity of his experience at the retreat. The key events are Preparing for Baba's visit to Gainesville Attending Baba's retreat in Atlanta Experiencing Shakti Pat and losing a sense of self during meditation Baba restoring the author to normal Contemplating the meaning and intensity of his experience The summary captures the sequence of events, the author's reactions and reflections, and the significance of Shakti Pat in his process of awakening and surrender. After Baba left, the author's life changed from solitude to service. His spiritual community proliferated, with many attending his classes and retreats. He was constantly busy with tasks and service. A professor asked the author to host a retreat for Mataji, a saint from India. During a walk on the author's land, Mataji said a great temple would be built there. Although the author resisted, a temple was built within six months in the spot Mataji specified. Funding for the temple came in just as needed, often in the exact amounts required for the next step of construction. The author designed the temple, and volunteers built it over three months. The first Sunday service in the new temple was held in September 1975. People brought spiritual items to adorn the temple, representing many religions and spiritual paths. The temple belonged to all those seeking the infinite. Though on earth, the temple pointed to the vastness of space and the billions of stars. The temple building showed how the author's life had moved from solitude to service and how spiritual community had grown around him. Despite initial resistance, the author surrendered to the flow of life and the temple was manifested. The spontaneous appearance of funding demonstrated how life provided when one followed its guidance. The author's spiritual center, Temple of the Universe, was becoming increasingly popular and hosting many visiting teachers and their retreats. One such visiting teacher, Amrit Desai, profoundly impacted the author. When the author sat beside Amrit during meditation, he felt an intense flow of energy and love that opened his heart chakra. This experience left the author with a permanent energy flow through his heart. Amrit also unexpectedly encouraged people to visit the temple for daily meditations. Though initially resistant, the author surrendered to this development. Despite the author's initial doubts, people have attended the temple's programs regularly for over 35 years. In 1976, Temple of the Universe was officially formed as a non-profit organization. The author signed over ownership of his property and buildings to the organization. He lived a simple life, earning little money and owning few possessions. That same year, the author married Donna, who had become integral to running the temple. Though hesitant about marriage at first, the author surrendered to the relationship. Upon returning from their wedding trip, the author and Donna found that people had been staying in the temple buildings during their absence and were now essentially living there. Though unplanned, a spiritual community had formed around the temple. The author concludes that he never intended to start a spiritual center but surrendered to the flow of life, which led to serving others through the temple. In summary, through a series of unplanned but profound events, the author's initial solitary spiritual practice evolved into a vibrant spiritual community centered around the temple of the universe. By surrendering to life rather than imposing his desires, the author was able to serve in a way he never could have imagined.
In 1976, the author was approached by a sheriff's deputy who asked if he would build an addition onto his house. Although the author had never built for anyone else before, he surrendered to life's flow and agreed to do the job. This first construction job led to more work and the creation of the author's company, Built with Love. With the help of Radha, who handled the bookkeeping, and the author's brother-in-law, who provided accounting advice, the company was incorporated. A man offered Built with Love the use of his contractor's license so they could take on more significant projects. This allowed Built with Love to build an addition onto Donna's cabin before the birth of their daughter, Durga Devi, in 1977. Built with Love started earning a few thousand dollars a month in addition to the author's teaching salary. Just as the author thought the energy flow might be complete, Built with Love received a call to convert an ABC liquor store into a clothing store. Despite some initial difficulties with the woman in charge of the project, the author focused on his mantra and completed the job. The author realized these events taught him detachment from preconceived ideas and attachment to desired outcomes. He was learning to accept whatever happened as part of life's divine plan. The key events are Building the addition for the sheriff's deputy, which led to the creation of Built with Love. Incorporating Built with Love and obtaining a contractor's license. Building the addition for Donna's cabin before Durga Devi's birth. Converting an ABC liquor store into a clothing store taught the author detachment and acceptance of life's flow. The author started a construction company called Built with Love. At first, the company did small renovation jobs homeowners financed. When a couple asked Built with Love to build them a house, the company needed a construction loan from a bank. However, Built with Love needed to meet the requirements for such a loan. The author visited many banks but was rejected. Finally, at one bank, the president, Jim Owens, personally approved a $20,000 construction loan for Built with Love. Owens told the author that he went out of his way to support local businesses. The author was grateful and promised not to let Owens down. Built with Love built the house for the couple. A decade later, the author ran into Owens, now running a video store. Owens was trying to get a $20,000 loan to support the store but was rejected by banks. The author repaid Owens' kindness by offering him a loan. The author saw it as fate that brought them together again. Around 1978, Built with Love was building custom homes and doing major renovations. The author left his teaching job at Santa Fe College because they wanted him full-time and using a standard textbook. The transition to focusing on Built with Love happened naturally. Built with Love was hired to build a house for a pro golfer, Tom Jenkins. Serendipitously, Jenkins bought land near the temple, with only one lot between them. The author saw it as another miracle. The author refers to the temple of the universe expanding, suggesting Built with Love's success and proximity to Jenkins 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 land was part of a more excellent plan. The author remained at middleman and caretaker, donating Built with Love's profits to the temple. The author regularly visited Union Correctional Institution, a maximum security prison, to teach them meditation and yoga. One inmate who attended the sessions was David, also known as Creature, who was a leader in the outlaw motorcycle gang. Despite his violent past and serving multiple life sentences, David was sincere in his spiritual practices and growth. Over time, David became a leader who organized meditation for other inmates. David told the author that authorities found bodies of rival gang members he had killed years earlier, and he would be charged. However, David saw it as an opportunity to work through past karma for his evil actions. While awaiting trial, David was in solitary confinement, where he spent hours meditating and chanting each day. David wrote a letter expressing his devotion and desire to meet Amrit, a yogi, though he knew it was unlikely given his circumstances. The author shared the letter with Amrit, who was moved and agreed to visit David, despite never visiting a prison. Amrit described David as a saint and was amazed at his spiritual transformation and wisdom. The story shows David's complete surrender and inner peace despite his challenging situation. His spiritual growth and leadership inspired the author and other inmates. David demonstrated that inner freedom is possible regardless of outer circumstances. The critical insights into surrender are Surrender makes complete inner peace and acceptance of one's circumstances possible. 
Spiritual growth and transformation can happen even in the most difficult of situations. Inner freedom is independent of outer circumstances. Helping others in their spiritual journey can inspire and transform one's practice. In 1978, the author encountered a personal computer for the first time at a Radio Shack store. It instantly fascinated him, and he felt an inner calling to work with computers. He bought a Radio Shack TRS-80, learned how to program it, and found that it came naturally to him. Working with the computer gave him a sense of peace and focus. Although he already had two full-time jobs, he made time late at night to learn about programming the computer. He started by writing an accounting system for his company built with love. The manager of the Radio Shack store was impressed with his work and started referring clients who wanted custom software programs written. This unplanned beginning led to the creation of Personalized Programming, a multi-million dollar software company. Like his other ventures, Personalized Programming started without business plans or investors. The author followed the flow of events and focused on serving the energy behind what was happening. The author started a successful one-person programming business called Personalized Programming in 1979. The business generated over $100,000 per year. In 1980, the author incorporated personalized programming for liability purposes though he didn't think it was necessary. The author loved his work and viewed the computers he installed as friends who worked for his clients for free. The author received two calls on the same day from medical practices looking for a patient billing system. After searching for an existing system and finding poorly designed software, the author agreed to develop custom software for the practices though he knew it would be a big project. The author started designing the software to become the medical manager, a product that revolutionized the medical practice management industry. The author didn't have a master plan to focus on the medical industry. He just served what life brought to him with passion and hard work. The scope of developing the medical billing software was more significant than anything he had done before. There needed to be formal plans, budgets or teams. The author just started coding the software on his own. The key points are. The author built a successful programming business by following life's flow and serving what was in front of him with passion. The author didn't strategically target the medical industry but ended up developing software for it after receiving requests for a medical billing system. The development of the medical manager was a pivotal moment that shaped the author's career journey for decades. However, it started from two phone calls and the author's willingness to take on a big, unplanned project. The author accomplished terrific things through surrender, passion, hard work and trusting in life's perfection. Formal planning and teams were absent. Does this summary accurately reflect the passage's key details and main takeaways? Let me know if you want want me to clarify or expand on any summary part. The author initially intended to write only part of the medical billing system. However, he accepted it as the next task given to him by the flow of life. He saw it as a gift to the universe and a part of his spiritual path of surrender. Halfway through writing the program, Barbara Duncan approached the author and offered to help him for free. Although hesitant at first, the author accepted her help. Barbara turned out to be extremely talented and became the first full-time employee of personalized programming. She helped the author finish the first version of the medical manager software. The author and Barbara's designs were never the simplest but always the best. For example, they developed a sophisticated system to allow practices to specify how to fill out insurance claim forms for different companies. This attention to detail and meeting clients' 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 needs contributed to the success of the software. After two years of development, the first version of the medical manager was installed for the author's first two clients in 1982. The author and his team were focused on perfecting the software rather than on what would happen next. The author saw the program as a living entity that they were meant to serve. In summary, the perfection with which events unfolded in creating the medical manager software mirrored the author's spiritual path of surrender. Although demanding, it was significant work for the author. The key events were Barbara Duncan approaching the author out of the blue and the level of talent and dedication she and the rest of the team brought to the project. The author had just finished developing a medical billing software called the Medical Manager. He received a surprise call from Systems Plus, a significant software distributor, expressing interest in his software. 
The president of Systems Plus flew out to meet the author and agreed to distribute the medical manager. The software was launched at the giant Comdex trade show in Las Vegas in 1982. It was an instant success. There were many requests for new features and customizations. Systems Plus also asked for additional practice management features like appointment scheduling to be added. The author did not have formal training in software design but relied on a combination of logical thinking and intuition to determine how to meet all the requests and build new features. The medical manager proliferated after it launched, gaining many new customers and requiring constant updates and improvements to the software. The author attributes its success to the forces of natural growth, doing quality work, meeting fundamental needs, serving others, and following the flow of life. The rapid growth of the business and the software was challenging but flowed smoothly due to these forces of natural growth. The author needed a strategic plan but focused on serving each new need and request as it arose. In summary, the launch and rapid growth of the medical manager software and business were fueled by serving the customer's needs, following the natural flow of life, using logic and intuition, and tapping into the power of natural growth by focusing on high quality and meeting actual demands. A strategic business plan was unnecessary as success unfolded. The author's company, Personalized Programming, grew rapidly and unexpectedly. They did not have a traditional business plan or strategy. They tried to keep up with the robust growth that seemed to be propelling them forward. Their growth was miraculous and organic. It happened spontaneously in a way that the author attributes to surrendering to the flow of life. In the mid-1980s, the author started getting calls from major Blue Cross Blue Shield organizations wanting to market the medical manager to doctors in their areas. This resulted in partnerships with Blue Cross Blue Shields in New York, New Jersey, South Carolina, Georgia, Arizona, Hawaii, Mississippi, Colorado, and others. The author saw this as evidence of the power of surrender and letting go of personal preferences. By 1986 to 1988, Personalized programming had about 12 employees and earned millions of dollars yearly in royalties. The author had to do business with large corporations, even though he had never worked at that level before. However, life provided on-the-job training, just as in other areas. The author continued to trust in the flow of life. The right people showed up at the right time to help the company. This included their corporate attorney. The author believes life orchestrated these perfect sequences of events. For example, Systems Plus asked personalized programming to host a visitor named Paul Dobbins, who had experience as a senior technical analyst. Although personalized programming was in a remote wooded area, Systems Plus sent him there because there was no choice. The visit ended up changing the company's direction very positively. Overall, the summary depicts a company undergoing extremely rapid growth in a spontaneous and unplanned fashion, guided by the author's philosophy of surrender and trust in life. The right opportunities and people serendipitously appeared at the correct times to help the company's progress. The author founded a successful medical software company called The Medical Manager. The company proliferated and the author found meditation and yoga helpful to stay focused. One day, the author and others found bulldozers clearing land next to their property. They contacted the owner, Wilbur, who said he was clearing the land to plant pine trees. The author offered to lease the land from Wilbur to preserve the beautiful woods. Wilbur agreed to a long-term lease at a high price. Shortly after, another piece of land became available next to their property. They purchased it, and the leased land now bordered their whole property. The author sees these events as miraculous and part of life's dance. By staying open and surrendering to experiences, positive outcomes emerge. Challenging situations create the energy for change. The author was learning to be still in difficult times to see the constructive actions required. Another example of an unlikely event was getting lost in Boston looking for a vegetarian restaurant and ending up at the only yoga center there, unplanned. The author sees life as a game where each move reveals more of the noisy, rational mind as an illusion. The critical roles discussed are the spiritual leader and president of the company, the author, and the product manager, Paul, who was a follower of the same spiritual teacher and eventually came to work for the company. By the early 1990s, the author felt the rapid growth of his business and the temple were over. Things had stabilized, 
and he expected a steady state going forward. However, the author experienced another period of unexpected growth due to paying close attention to subtle messages or nudges from life guiding him. Unexpected opportunities arose by following these subtle messages instead of his personal preferences and reactions. For example, in 1990 the temple was offered the chance to purchase 85 beautiful acres of land neighboring their current property. Even though they weren't looking to purchase more land, the opportunity seemed like a gift from the universe that fell into place quickly. A few months later, they were then able to purchase the land surrounding this new property from a neighbor who was moving. This allowed the temple to own 170 contiguous acres of land, even better than if they had purchased it all at once. The author's friend Radha then challenged him to build a proper house for himself, suggesting that a flow of life and the temple's resources allowed for it. The author said he would wait for a clear message to build a house. Just two weeks later, the author's neighbor called to say he was selling his house bordering temple property. The author saw this as the clear message he was waiting for. Upon visiting the house, the author found it was beautifully handcrafted over 12 years and the perfect home for him. In summary, by surrendering to the flow of life's subtle messages, unexpected opportunities arose allowing for growth and gifts beyond what the author could have imagined or designed himself. His new home and surrounding land were perfect examples of this. The narrator was content with his life in 1991, he had a thriving business, a loving family, and an active spiritual community. However, unbeknownst to him, significant changes were coming. His business, Personalized Programming, was poised for massive growth, expanding from 25 to over 300 employees and requiring a much larger office space. The first hint of impending change came when a zoning inspector showed up at Personalized Programming's office. He informed the narrator that the business needed proper zoning to operate at its current location. After exploring options, it became clear that the only viable solution was finding a new property to relocate the business. The narrator promised the zoning official would resolve the issue, though he was reluctant to move the business away from its spiritual home at the temple. Months passed without finding a suitable new property. Then, two significant events occurred. The temple purchased an adjoining 50-acre property that provided road access. Though the purpose of this purchase was unrelated, it would later become integral to solving the zoning problem. Plans were announced to build a massive construction waste dump across from the new temple property. The temple and local citizens protested, convincing the city not to approve the dump until a comprehensive waste management plan was developed. Because the dump was denied approval, the 185-acre property suddenly became available for sale. Since the land was within city limits, it could be zoned for business use. The narrator realized this was life providing the perfect solution to personalized programming's need for a new home. Through a series of unforeseen events, life guided the narrator to the ideal property on which his business could relocate and continue its destined growth. He recognized life's perfection, even without understanding how all the pieces fit together. By trusting in the flow of events, a solution was provided. The author's company personalized programming proliferated from 25 to 55 employees within a year. This fast growth brought many challenges in management and operations. The author realized she needed serious help to run the company's technical-slash-software side and the business side. Tim Staley, an experienced IT consultant, applied for a job at Personalized Programming. Despite their very different backgrounds and styles, the author and Tim bonded over their shared spirituality. The author hired Tim to help organize and manage the software development teams. Personalized Programming's main product, the medical manager, was over 15 years old and struggling to keep up with the demands of larger healthcare organizations. They realized they needed to completely rewrite the product to establish a solid foundation for the future. The decision to rewrite the product was risky, requiring a considerable investment of resources and money. However, the author realized Tim was brought to them specifically to lead this ambitious re-engineering effort. Couldn't afford to slow down development to focus on the rewrite, so Tim was tasked with re-engineering the medical manager into a new product. In contrast, the development of the current product continued at a rapid pace. The key events are the company's fast growth required more advanced management and technical skills, Tim Staley, an experienced IT consultant, was hired and bonded with the author over their shared spirituality, 
the aging medical manager product needed to be rewritten to meet current demands and enable future growth, and Tim was brought in specifically to lead this challenging rewrite effort. In 1995, personalized programming had grown to 75 employees and $10 million in revenue. The company and its product, the medical manager, were very successful. The author thought the company had grown as big as possible and expected it to remain steady. However, he was committed to surrendering to whatever unfolded in life. His spiritual practice of letting go and embracing what manifested had led to excellent results and inner peace. The author learned that Systems Plus and many dealers wanted to merge into one company to compete nationally better. A dealer, John Kong, proposed buying personalized programming, Systems Plus, and some other dealers to form one large company. The author did not want to sell personalized programming but felt obligated to consider it so others could benefit. Kong returned with buy-in from some dealers and Systems Plus. Despite misgivings, the author surrendered to what was manifesting. Kong offered to buy personalized programming, including cash and stock in the new company. He worked to merge the companies and raise $150 million through an initial public offering, IPO, of shares in 1997. Though the new company would initially lack personalized programming's organization, the author did not dwell on the negatives and remained committed to surrendering to life. The new company was named Medical Manager Corporation, MMGR, and went public in 1997. The author became the CEO, while others became president and general counsel. Headquarters were in Tampa, while the author and general counsel worked in Alachua. The author's father, a stockbroker, was intrigued by his son's company going public. Although they had been estranged for years, they reconnected over this common interest before the father passed away. When going through paperwork in his safety deposit box, the author found the original stock certificate for his company, now worth over $100 million. He was moved by how much had unfolded since starting the company. As CEO, the author worked hard to stay on top of what was happening in the widespread company. He required weekly reports from executives and held conference calls. He hired a young woman named Sabrina as an executive assistant. Though young, she had grown up in the industry and could provide high-level help. Growth opportunities for the company were acquiring existing dealers and connecting doctors electronically to insurance companies, labs, pharmacies, etc. The author put Sabrina in charge of the latter initiative, Medical Manager Network Services, which succeeded. Over the next two years, the company acquired many dealers and proliferated. Though it was demanding work, the author found that immersing himself in the flow of life and work only strengthened his spiritual energy and connection. Constant surrender and letting go of ego were the keys. The author had led Medical Manager Corporation for nearly 30 years and was hesitant to make changes that interfered with the company's progress. However, the rise of the internet in the late 1990s posed a threat as competitors could access physicians online without the company's dealer network. Medical Manager's executives became aware of Synetic, an advanced healthcare internet portal company interested in a merger. Synetic saw Medical Manager's 100,000 connected physicians as a way to become the dominant player in the industry. Synetic offered $1.3 billion to acquire Medical Manager. The author was initially reluctant to give up control of the company he had built. However, he realized Medical Manager had outgrown what he could provide alone. The merger would allow the company to reach its full potential. The author decided to surrender to the flow of life and trust the process. The author and Synetic's chairman, Marty Wygod, met and found they could work well despite their differences. The medical manager board approved the merger, which was announced in May 1999. The summary describes a significant moment of profound personal, professional, and spiritual growth for the author. Despite his initial discomfort, he could let go of control and do what was best for the company's progress. The author's ability to accept change and surrender to life's flow allowed this necessary merger to move forward. Medical Manager Corporation merged with Synetic and became WebMD. John Kong and the author were co-COS. WebMD's main competitors were WebMD and Healthion. They merged and acquired Envoy, a central claims clearinghouse. This put WebMD at a competitive disadvantage. WebMD's stock price fell 70% shortly after announcing the merger with Medical Manager. 
a drastic restructuring was needed. Marty became chairman and brought in Marv Rich to restructure the company. The goal was to cut costs and only keep divisions that could quickly become profitable. The author accompanied Marv to meet with WebMD's 800-plus person development team in California. They demanded significant pay increases. Marv fired most of them when they refused to compromise. A new team of 40 rebuilt the website. Marv's reorganization team then evaluated medical manager, now called the Practice Services Division. Despite having 2,000 employees, they were able to show their value through successful products and $50 million in revenue. The author reflected that medical managers had grown tremendously to keep up with industry changes. However, through these challenges, he strengthened spiritually by letting go of discomfort and strengthening his inner resolve. The key events are the merger of medical manager and WebMD, the subsequent drop in WebMD's stock price, the restructuring efforts, the downsizing of the development team, and the evaluation of the practice services division. Through all this, the author focuses on the personal growth he gained by remaining open to these difficulties. The author received many recognitions and honors in 2000 for the success of the medical manager. His friend Ray Kurzweil invited him to attend an event at the White House where Kurzweil received the National Medal of Honor for Technology. The author found the experience surreal, given his background as a yogi living in the woods. Shortly after, the medical manager was inducted into the Smithsonian Institution for its role in the IT revolution. The DOJ questioned the Healthion slash WebMD medical manager merger due to concerns about the market power medical manager network services had gained through its relationship with Envoy. The author met with the DOJ and teams of attorneys to address their concerns. After intense questioning, they were able to satisfy the DOJ that the merger would not pose antitrust issues. The author found the experience challenging but helpful for personal growth, as dealing with influential people and high-pressure situations required letting go of ego and reactivity. The more life put him through, the less his inner state was disturbed by outer circumstances. Constant challenges were molding him into the person he needed to become. The key events are Attending an event at the White House where Kurzweil received the National Medal of Honor. The medical manager being inducted into the Smithsonian Institution. Meeting with the DOJ to address antitrust concerns over the Healthion slash WebMD merger. Finding that responding to intense life challenges with non-attachment and surrender shaped his ability to handle difficulties with equanimity. The summary covers the major events, meetings, and insights related to the recognition and responsibilities the author experienced in 2000 due to the success of the medical manager. On September 3, 2003, the FBI raided Todd's R&D facility in Alachua, Florida. They took control of the entire facility, shutting down phone lines and the computer system. Todd drove to the facility, where he found sheriff's vehicles blocking the entrance and helicopters flying overhead. He was allowed in and met with FBI agents, who presented him with a search warrant giving them complete control. The search warrant listed about 30 people essential to the investigation, including Todd's executive management team, attorneys, and accountants. One name that stood out was Pat Sedlicek, who was being investigated internally for taking kickbacks. Todd suspected the raid might be related to the illegal activity of Bobby Davids, the VP of Acquisitions, who had been arranging kickbacks and hiding money in shell companies. Though the internal investigation was ongoing, Todd didn't understand why the FBI would raid them when everything was readily available. Todd spoke with WebMD's general counsel, who said WebMD's headquarters had also been raided. They suspected Bobby might have tried to cut a deal by claiming all the executives were involved, though the evidence didn't support that. The general counsel said to cooperate with the agents fully. Todd felt a sense of peace during the raid, knowing he had done nothing wrong. He wanted to experience the extraordinary situation fully. The FBI took virtually everything, clearing offices and making copies of computer drives. In summary, the key points are. The FBI conducted a surprise raid of Todd's company, taking control and removing massive amounts of information. Todd suspected the raid was related to an internal investigation by a VP and a few employees into kickbacks and fraud. Though confused by the extreme actions, Todd remained at peace, believing the truth would come out. 
The FBI took a considerable amount of paperwork, documents, and electronic files, essentially grinding operations to a halt. The author wakes up to find newspaper headlines about the FBI raid on his company's offices. Although he knows he did nothing wrong, he realizes his life will be difficult. He resolves not to let the situation affect his inner peace. The company hires many attorneys to represent itself and its executives. The author, unfamiliar with legal matters, follows the advice of his colleagues and hires his attorney. He chooses Randy Turk, a well-respected criminal defense attorney. Turk explains that the government investigation was triggered by the company's former CFO, Bobby Davids. Davids had been stealing money from the company for years. Facing punishment for his crimes, Davids went to the U.S. Attorney's Office and falsely claimed that the company's executives, including the author, were involved in accounting fraud. For months, Davids fed lies to the government, and they launched an investigation based on his claims. Although there was no evidence to support Davids's accusations, the government would try to find evidence that seemed to confirm what Davids had said. The author realizes that following life's flow has led him to his attorney, Randy Turk. Together, they will face the legal ordeal ahead. Here is a summary of L.A. Singer based on the information provided. L.A. Singer was the CEO of Medical Manager Corporation, a healthcare IT company. In 2002, the FBI raided Medical Manager and seized many documents related to the company's accounting practices from 1997 to 2003. Singer initially felt confident that the investigation would clear him and his executives of any wrongdoing. However, he soon learned that he was one of the main targets of the investigation. The government was pursuing, headhunting and going after top executives. In 2005, three medical manager executives pleaded guilty to accounting and mail fraud. They agreed to testify against Singer and the other executives in exchange for light sentences. This made Singer realize the government had stacked the cards against them. Due to the investigation and the bad publicity, Singer resigned as CEO of Medical Manager in 2005. However, he felt at peace with the decision and saw it as part of the flow of life. While waiting for the investigation to conclude, Singer began writing a book called The Untethered Soul. He worked on the book with Karen Entner, an employee who had worked with him for over 15 years. In late 2005, Singer's attorney provided him with documents the government intended to use to prove his guilt. However, Singer did not find anything incriminating in the documents. The government was pursuing a weak case based chiefly on motive and the testimony of the executives who had pleaded guilty. In December 2005, Singer and nine other former medical manager executives were indicted on federal charges. They were ordered to turn themselves in to the authorities. That covers the key highlights and events in the summary of L.A. Singer based on the information provided. Please let me know if you want me to clarify or expand on any summary part. Michael A. Singer and nine other medical manager executives were arraigned in Charleston, South Carolina, in federal court on December 28. They were charged with conspiracy in an indictment that claimed they caused improper accounting practices, though Bobby Davids committed the offenses. Singer was shocked by the indictment but his lawyer, Randy McClanahan, said it was standard for the prosecution to present the most robust case. The truth would emerge at trial. At the arraignment, the executives greeted each other warmly, though their lawyers advised against speaking. Singer introduced himself to the prosecutor, who did not like him. The judge released them without bail. The arraignment and interacting with the inmates in the courtroom made Singer reflect on his journey through life. Though the prosecution affected many areas of his life, including ending his prison work, he was determined to maintain inner peace. Disclosure of evidence seized in the raid two years earlier was slow. Eventually, they received some of the 1.2 million emails and notes from FBI interviews. Reviewing the evidence, no hard evidence tied the executives to David's 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 actions. However, circumstantial evidence could be exploited. Amid this, Singer focused on writing The Untethered Soul to share teachings on inner freedom. His lawyer warned that the book could be used against him but allowed Singer to publish it, which he did quickly. Michael Singer's legal team requested and received a bill of particulars, forcing the government to specify the wrongdoings they accused him of. This gave Singer's team a chance to defend themselves. 
Singer gained a new appreciation for the U.S. Constitution and the rights it guaranteed him, like the right to know the nature of the charges against him. He saw how the Founding Fathers protected citizens from government overreach. Singer's lead attorney, Randy Sonner, was diagnosed with cancer but continued fighting for Singer case. Sonner had to undergo chemotherapy but was granted a three-month extension for Singer's trial to continue representing Singer. Another lead attorney was brought on in case Sonner could not recover quickly. Singer's legal team made progress unraveling the case against Singer and Bobby's lies. They found evidence contradicting Bobby's claims. However, more work was still needed, and the judge set a firm trial date for February 2009. Despite setbacks, Singer maintained a positive attitude, seeing himself as part of an excellent legal team defending him against Bobby's deceit. He continued letting go of his ego and focused on contributing to his defense. Randy, the lead attorney, began chemotherapy treatment and had to step away from the case for a few months. During this time, the workload increased as the trial date approached. The associate attorney, Alex Walsh, updated me on the pretrial hearings. The motions in limine allowed the defense to challenge questionable evidence presented by the prosecution. Many of the challenges were successful. Judge Blatt, who had overseen the case for over three years, had to step down due to health issues. This was disheartening as Judge Blatt seemed fair and knew the details of the complex case. Judge Norton took over and the trial date was pushed back five months to January 2010. Randy eventually returned to the total capacity. Judge Norton's rulings were similar to Judge Blatt's, indicating he also saw weaknesses in the prosecution's case. By October 2009, three months before the new trial date, it seemed that only I, John Kong and John Sessions would likely go to trial as the prosecution was dropping charges against other defendants. Randy estimated it would take divine intervention for me to avoid trial. Donna and I went to Charleston to rent housing, expecting a four-month trial and potentially more extended incarceration. Mid-December, Randy indicated the prosecution suddenly seemed interested in settlement. They wanted me out of the case. I insisted charges be dropped with nothing on my record. I always believed we followed accounting principles, but now I see Bobby did some improper things. For weeks before trial, the prosecution agreed to drop all charges if I gave up stock sale proceeds from 12 years earlier in case the share price had been affected. I agreed though I doubted it was affected. John Kong and John Sessions went to trial. Though the trial went well for the defense, the jury found them guilty, stunning the defense and judge. Juror interviews suggested most made up their minds after the prosecution's opening arguments. The truth was not uncovered. John Kong and John Sessions were found guilty in a trial and awaited sentencing. Their defense team filed a motion to dismiss the case based on the statute of limitations. The judge granted the motion and dismissed the entire case against them. The judge criticized the government for handling the case, including keeping many people under indictment for five years and then dropping charges before trial. The defense also filed a motion for a retrial, arguing that the evidence did not support the jury verdict. Nearly a year after the trial, the judge granted the motion for retrial, effectively overturning the jury's verdict. The author was relieved Kong and Sessions were free and cleared their records. He saw it as the system working to protect citizens from government overreach.